Hello, my name is Luigi Manfredi, and I would like to welcome you to tutorial number two of the Smart Grid Com conference for this year. Uh, I hope you have been enjoying the virtual conference. And uh, this tutorial is focused on power system machine learning applications. Uh, the subtitle is from physics informed learning for decision support to inference at the edge for control. I'm joined in this uh, tutorial by Tetiana Bogodurova, and, uh, who is a research scientist uh, at RPI with my team, and Sergio Dorado Rojas, who is a PhD student in my group. The goal of this tutorial is to provide some insights that we have gained as power system specialists on using machine learning to develop power system applications that use both measurements and physics informed modeling and simulation. Uh, the scope of this presentation is really how to frame the power system problems themselves and then how to apply ma existing machine learning methods and technologies. Uh, the, the goal of this tutorial is not to invent new machine learning but is how do we use it to solve practical power system problems. So welcome, and I hope you will enjoy this tutorial. Before we start, I would like to uh, acknowledge um, a few people and institution. First, I would like to acknowledge our uh, colleagues that have contributed to the work that we're presenting here, especially to uh, Ilya Sayachi, and Professor Shehab Ahmed from uh, the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Um, we have a project together called GridX, which is fund, fu funded by the Center of Excellence for Neon Research at the same university. And in particular, Ilias and, uh, uh, did a lot of the work that you will see in the third part of the presentation when I was working with them last year. Uh, during the summer for a couple months. Uh, the other uh, people we would like to acknowledge is uh, Marcelo de Castro, who is also a PhD student in my uh, team, and Dr. Denis Osipov, who is a, a postdoc in another group at RPI, but who contributed also to some of the work I will be presenting. Uh, so the first and second part of the tutorial is uh, the results that we have obtained in a project called DeepGrid that is funded by the New York Energy Research and Development Agency through the Electric Power Transmission and Distribution uh, High Performance Grid Program under Grant Agreement 137951. And this project is um, the prime funder, uh, the prime uh, fund receiver is uh, NIPA, and we are working in that project with them. And the third part of this presentation is supported, as I uh, already mentioned, by uh, a Coast University. So I would like to thank uh, all of these individuals, and um, in particular, uh, both NYSERDA and um, a, a, the NEOM Center at COWS for uh, the funding so that we could actually do some research. So the uh, organization of the tutorial is gonna be as follows. Uh, uh, after this introduction, Tatiana Bogorova will start uh, giving a, a short motivation. Uh, we are not gonna dwell too much time on this, but just to frame a little bit our perspective. And then she will continue uh, discussing uh, how, uh, in part one, which is dedicated on uh, how you generate synthetic data for uh, decision-making applications so that you can train machine learning algorithms. So this is a very important topic. Uh, just generating simulations randomly is gonna get you nowhere. We need a good way of designing simulation scenarios. So uh, this is what Tatiana will present uh, and this picture here is from that part of the, the tutorial. So the second part is by my PhD student, uh, Sergio Dorado Rojas, and he will be discussing how we're using machine learning to perform small signal stability assessment. Uh, 
this is a short version of what he will be presented in full in a, 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 in a workshop on November 11 from 1230, 12 10 to 1 30 p.m. Uh, so this part of the of the presentation focuses now that you know how to generate synthetic data for training, how do you train an, a vast array of machine learning algorithms to perform a classification for power system stability. Uh, so uh, in this part, you will see many methods, both conventional machine learning methods and uh, uh, the new deep learning uh, type methods for this purpose. And finally, I will close up the, the tutorial uh, discussing how do we use a, a machine learning at the edge. So inference at the edge is the, the main um, goal. And I investigate this uh, looking at real-time force oscillation detection using this type of edge devices, which are embedded systems that are being used, for example, for autonomous vehicles. So uh, that's the last part of the presentation, and I will uh, give you all those conclusions of the oral tutorial and give also some um, uh, uh, references and where you can download the code from what we could prepare for it. So before we start, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Tetiana Bogodorova, who will continue the the tutorial from here. She is a research scientist at RPI working with my team at Alcelta. She is uh, leading the project uh, on deep learning applications for smart grid operators, and she is also a, a, a key contributor in the project, uh, developing deep learning algorithms and the recommender system that we are building for these purposes. Um, Tatiana, thank you for joining us, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the rest of the presentation. I would like to start with overview of potential machine learning applications in power system operation and control. The hierarchical power system operation and control can be divided into generating unit controls, transmission control, and system generation control and demand, re demand response. Generating unit controls correspond to primary control that include prime mover uh, controls and excitation controls. The desired power output of the generating units is regulated by system generation control that balances the total system generation against system load and losses. Also, a demand response balances the loads to smooth out the peaks of power demand. These controls are complemented with transmission controls that perform reactive power and voltage control activating static wire compensators, switched reactors and capacitors, tap change in transformers. Some of these controls are activated by operator. Each level of power system operation and control machine learning can be of use combining uh, the available knowledge about uh, power system and including external factors such as outside temperature, tree location, solar, solar radiation and wind data. Machine learning can help to identify systems operating state, detect oscillations, perform decision making at higher level control, provide generation consumption, forecast using historical data. In the deep grid project, machine learning aimed to help operators with decision making using available data about the power system. The project aims to develop a recommender system that would recommend operator which action to take. Since recommender system is a machine learning model that has to be trained using a lot of data, the reminder of this presentation will focus on the data generation. The key is to combine measurements and simulations 
for training a machine learning model. The following part of this tutorial will be focused on realistic contingency design to generate data for machine learning. Motivation to develop such approach lies in the following. First, machine learning algorithms won't follow a good performance if the data is not good. What is the good data? In this case, the data must contain all the required dynamics, patterns, uh, the machine learning algorithm must learn and recognize in the production when it is going to make decisions. Second, collecting PMU measurements takes time, uh, occupies a vast volume of storage, contains incomplete data, for example, what was the cause of the disturbance that PMU has recorded. It means that the data engineer will have to combine several sources of data to make a complete picture. Thus, it is expensive to do. The cheapest solution is to use validated power system models to provide valuable physics-informed data. Some extra statistics available in technical reports and papers can be used as well. Thus, the goal is to propose a systematic approach to automatically design realistic single and multi-event contingencies. This approach includes identification of probability of number of events, the probability of how far the next event is located with respect to previous uh, events, uh, time between events, duration of the short circuit. The graph theory is employed to identify a network connectedness to prevent uh, islanding uh, to verify that at least one generator is connected after the events uh, happen in, in the contingency. These uh, dis distributions are identified and parameterized based on real power system properties. Fault Clearing time uh, sampling uh, performed from a shifted gamma distribution that is identified considering parameters of real power system. A typical fault clearing time that is five cycles of a 60 Hz sine wave, while the shortest fault clearing time is about three cycles. The maximum time that is a circuit breaker can remain closed under short time withstand current is 30 cycles or uh, half a second. The example code for fault clearing time sampling in Python is available at GitHub by the link pro provided below. Fault type sampling is performed according to statistics about a real power system. Thus, single phase faults constitute 70% of total faults, two phase fault has 20%, when three phase faults has 10% of all faults. The example of the probability mass function is provided in Python by the link. For generator fault location is said to be at the terminal bus, when for a transformer the fault uh, is uniformly selected among its terminal buses. For transmission lines, the location of the fault within the length of a line is sampled using a uniform distribution. The idea is to generate trajectories of power system signals after contingency. To include required system dynamics into the data, we use validated power system models to simulate contingency. Conti the contingency is defined as a failure of one or more elements in a system. For that, we propose to use graph theory that allows to detect a change of topology of the system. For example, two-area control system can be presented by the graph 
uh, uh, by the graph as shown in this slide. Later, we will explain all the contingency generation process for this system. How to generate the data? Start with sampling of elements of contingency. If number of elements is 1, continue with the check of connectedness of the graph's elements and presence of generation. We are interested in such contingencies that do not create islands, therefore do not change behavior of the system as a whole. If number of elements are more than two in a loop for each consecutive element, we define the location of the next element by sampling a distance between elements. Adjacency matrix diagonal defines how many generators are connected to the power system. When a number of eigenvalues of a Laplacian matrix that are approximately equal to zero defines a uh, number of islands in power system of the applied contingency. Which ideas are behind the algorithm? Sampling number of elements of contingency performed from geometric distribution function that is identified from historical data. Sampling of distance between elements follows the same type of distribution but with different coefficients. This function was identified from a power flow change ratio as a function of distance after contingency. This slide shows an example of the next element of contingency selection. When first element is tripped, the next element to be tripped has higher probability to be located closer to the previous one. After the first element is tripped, for example, between bus 7 and 8, the algorithm will define the probability of the next element location according to geometric distribution with limited support. In other words, the probability of the next element to be chosen decays with the distance from the previously tripped element. This corresponds to the real cascade of trips in real power system. After the data is generated, the trajectories measured at power system buses uh, have, has, have to be labeled before uh, can be fed to machine learning supervised learning algorithm. Here we show an example of data labeling with power system operating state, stable, marginally stable, unstable, defined using small signal stability index to monitor system's operating condition using measured data. To conclude, we would like to mention several points. Data generation is time-consuming. The most time-consuming part of machine learning pipeline is data extraction, generation, and data preprocessing. Arguably, it takes 50 to 80% of time. Be careful when generating data. What you give to the model to learn defines the, out the output. Use real data directly or indirectly for data generation. Tools are important. They define flexibility. For example, Modelica gives full access to adjust parameters and computational time allowing for multi-core computing for simulation. Use GPU computing for machine learning using Python. This is much faster than using MATLAB. Welcome to the second part of the tutorial. This part of the tutorial is going to be presented by Sergio Dorado Rojas, who is a PhD student at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute working in my research group, Alzula. Sergio is a Manuel Ponce de Leon electrical engineer with an honors degree and is currently finishing his uh, master thesis in industrial automation 
from Universidad Nacional de Colombia. Uh, he is a DAAD alumni from the, the Young Engineers Program, and he is a former intern at the Control and Data Services Department at Rolls-Royce Deutschland LTD, and he was an extern at IBM during the, this this summer. Uh, Sergio, thank you for pre pre preparing all of this very nice material and I hope you will enjoy the rest of the presentation. Welcome to the second part of the tutorial called Machine Learning Based Small Signal Stability Assessment. The outline of this part is as follows. First, we will go through some motivation of why this work is important in the context of modern power systems. Then we will discuss some preliminaries regarding small signal stability before jumping into one of the main contributions of this part that is the an ad hoc Monte Carlo method uh, for synthetic data generation. After this, we will see how the data that is massively generated thanks to this uh, proposed technique will be used for um, designing several machine learning techniques. First, we will see how this data is pre-processed and then afterwards uh, how the data was configured in a training for, setup for our designing a machine learning algorithm. Finally, we will see the results of the different um, techniques in a, in a benchmark using a metric that we have proposed. And finally, we will conclude this work. So let's get started by talking a little bit about the motivation of, of why is this work important in the context of modern power systems. As we know, simulations are used to gain insight into future and current operations of the grid. But nowadays, due to the, due to, to the increasing complexity of electrical systems, we Require not, we require a large amount of simulations that indeed produce a large scale data. So now we're talking about big data in power systems. For this reason, we need to automate not only the process of, calc of generating the data, of performing the simulations, but also the process of processing the data to extract information that is valuable for the power systems of, uh, for the power system operators. So in this context is where machine learning has gained popularity in the power system community. Basically, machine learning al allows us to extract information from data. However, some machine learning algorithms are hard to interpret. So they behave like strange black boxes. So we would like to give machine learning explainability and that can be achieved by something that is called physics-based simulation. So this more or less in a nutshell can be defined as the approach in which the data that is used to train different machine learning algorithms is produced in such a way that it makes sense so that it brings the process brings some domain knowledge to machine learning having said that it is worth to recall or to repeat a little bit why machine learning is important so machine learning has been defined, and this is, this is accepted among the computer science community, as the art of programming computers to learn from data. And the reason, so the reason why this has been um, become popular, extremely popular in the recent years, is because several domains where large scale data happens have now the computing power to process that data massively. And we in power systems are not uh, are not an exception because we have data inputs like PMUs and simulations that nowadays produce that large scale of data. And what we want to do with large that, that, that data is to extract uh, patterns or perform predictions. So we will limit ourselves for, for this uh, case of study to the simulation um, domain where our data inputs or what we want from our data inputs is to extract information valuable from the system. So, as I have said, our inputs are thousands or millions of simulation results and our outputs are metrics that can be used for system assessment. So we want, the, we want to get a comprehensive picture of the stability and resiliency of an electrical grid. So basically, what we want to do is to train a machine learning algorithm to bring us from A, the data inputs that we have, to B, that is the system assessment metric that we want to produce. Now, 
let's summarize the main key points of, of this part of the presentation. So first of all, uh, we would like to present another sampling technique for generating scenarios. In this case, it's an ad hoc Monte Carlo method. So this is the, the way in which the different contingency scenarios will be produced. So basically how we will limit data generation for physically meaningful uh, contingency scenarios. Then the big data that is produced from this massive amount of simulations will be used to train classification algorithms. So we would like to know whether the system is behaving in an acceptable way or if we need or if the operator needs to uh, perform some action to improve the stability margins of the power system. And the, classif the classification met methods that we proposed uh, are based on machine learning. So we will study where uh, different machine conventional machine learning uh, techniques and assemble neural network to uh, evaluate whether the system is small signal stable or not. And finally, since we have proposed many classifiers, uh, we introduce as well a metric to quantify the performance of uh, the aforementioned uh, classify classification algorithms. So let's get uh, started by a small um, overview of what small signal stability is. So according to um, Kundur, a small signal is the ability of the power system to maintain synchronism when subjected to small disturbances. Uh, the way I like to remember this definition is actually by a picture I have seen in my undergrad in a microelectronics book. So here what we have is a nonlinear system. In this case, it's a static system with a, in this, uh, the, we have like here like a quadratic behavior, but we know that for dynamical systems like our systems, we have a nonlinear state space representation. So what we would like to do is to assess uh, to quantify some metric, to quantify some characteristics of the response of the system when it is operating close to an equilibrium. So in that case, what we would like to do is to compute a linear approximation. And the most simple form and or the form that we are most familiar with is an LTI system represented in this way. We know that the matrices A, B, C, and D are computed as the um, as a process of uh, differentiation of the functions f and g with respect uh, to the states and the, the inputs. And this is computed at the, at the equilibrium that we want to analyze. And basically, this representation is valid when we remain within a neighborhood of the equilibrium. So we can draw many conclusions of uh, based on, on this uh, linear time invariant representation, but perhaps the most important ones are drawn by studying one single matrix. That is the system matrix A. So we know that the system matrix A has um, has some associated some numbers that are really important, that are the eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues are important because they, they determine the shape of the modes of the system. So depending on the algebraic multiplicity of the eigenvalues, we will have that these are the modes that are produced by them. And uh, to be more concrete, depending on the location of the eigenvalues, we would know how the system is behaving. So there is, we see here on the this picture again on the on the left, where depending whether the eigenvalues are real or they have or the or if the, they are complex conjugate. Um, they, they will, we know that in this case, we will have a purely exp decaying exponential response, whether for everything that is located in the right half plane, we will have unstable behavior. But um, there is a metric that is the damping ratio that happens to be unique and it happens to be not only unique, but uh, scalar. So but if the damping ratio, for example, is negative, we know that the eigenvalues are in the on the right half plane. If it's zero, we know that they are oscillating. Between zero and one, we know they are complex conjugates, so we will see some oscillations in the system response. And when it's larger than one, we, we know that what we can expect from the modes is a uh, exponential behavior. So what we would like to emphasize here is that 
just the knowledge of the damping ratio is enough to classify the, the mode that is produced by the eigenvalues. So the damping ratio can be used as a discriminative sky, scalar metric to, quant to classify the condition of the system after the occurrence of a disturbance. So now that we know what metric will be used to classify the, con the, the operation of the system, we need to um, start talking about data generation. So how the large scale data that is needed to train machine learning solutions uh, will be generated. So for that reason, we will rest uh, constrain ourselves to the IEEE 14 bus system. So we know that in this system, we have five generators, 16 lines, and four transformers between buses. We could study many types of contingencies, but we will restrict our attention to line openings. So in this case, we have 20 different elements connecting the system nodes. And there are many ways in which we can open the lines. So we can, for example, go to the uh, power system simulation software and remove line 14. But by doing that, we will be changing the number of variables in the differential algebraic equation system that needs to be solved for, uh, to get dynamic simulation data. Uh, but not only we will be reducing the number of variables, but we will be also altering the topology of the system. So a simple workaround that we have proposed is that uh, what if we keep the system as it is, we keep the number of variables, we keep the topology um, fixed, but we take advantage of the fact that for line openings, each of these components has a transversal impedance um, inside. So if we take the transversal reactance and make it and make it arbitrarily large, for example, 10 to the 12, we would be emulating a line opening. So this trick allows us, as I have said before, to keep the number of states or the size of the A matrix the same. By doing that, we can um, compare different contingency scenarios with each other. Now the question is, how do we, so if we have, we know now what, how the contingencies will be generated, but then uh, the next step should be to describe how will the contingencies look like? So what lines will be opened and how we did, how will we determine uh, the order or the, the fashion in which the lines will be selected. So for this case, let's consider Let's let's uh, consider the variable n, that is the total number of branches in the system. For the IEEE bus, is 20. And uh, for simplicity, let's consider the case in which just one line will be opened at the same time. So k equals 1. So we would like to extract uh, combinations of one element out of, out of 20. So this is pretty straightforward, and the total number of scenarios will be given by the combinatorial of n and k. Uh, however, we, to give some, um, to, to, to construct scenarios only of physical significance, we need to constrain this number. So the minimum number of simultaneous con trippings would be 1, and the maximum number has to be n minus 1, because disconnecting all the lines simultaneously has no physical, uh, set, no physical meaning. So the total number of possible scenarios will be the sum of S and K from K min to K max. That is this number over here that corresponds to a little bit more than 1 million scenarios for the Tipperly for Timbo system. So that is a lot of scenarios. So we could simulate all of them to generate large scale data. In this case, in the form of A matrices for which we will compute the corresponding eigenvalues. But a valid question at this point would be, okay, so would all of these 1 million scenarios be physically meaningful? And the answer is no, because a scenario with, uh, if we simulate 100 scenarios with 10 simultaneous line trippings, that is something that in such a small system, is if this system were really, wouldn't be allowed by the system operator. So we need to constrain the number of simultaneous trippings that a course that, that determines a, a contingency scenario. So for that reason, 
we propose a two-stage Monte Carlo method. On the first stage, we sample the, or we select the number of contingencies that will be open following a probability distribution. It, this the probability distribution acknowledges the fact that scenarios with a smaller number of events are more likely to happen. So tripping one line is more likely to happen than tripping two same, at the same time. And tripping two is more likely than uh, tripping three. So uh, the probability distribution that we have used is a modified Poisson distribution given by this formula here. And sampling from this Poisson distribution gives us k. And then when we have k, that is the number of simultaneous contingencies, we go to this uh, first um, combinatorial method and we get one scenario from the pool of all possible scenarios with that number of tripping. So that is the second stage of the Monte Carlo method. Uh, here we have you know, um, uh, a simple visual the, um, of the probability distribution function. So as I have said before, we can verify here that the probability of occurrence of trippings, for example, of, uh, of trippings with uh, of contingencies with one tripping is larger than two, and correspondingly this is larger than three, four, five. Uh, but we have done something here to help the method uh, escalate with respect to computational efficiency. So we have restrict this probability distribution to n minus five for systems that have more than 30 branches. That is that is basically the number of branches is the criteria the criterion that we have used to define a large system. So why we have done this? Basically because we have um, the the study we have performed, we have taken four different systems, a triple e nine, seven bus uh, fourteen, and Nordic forty four. The systems are different in the number of buses the number of states, the number of variables, branches, and the amount of scenarios that can be generated. But here on the on the right, we see that if the system starts having more than 28, 29 lines, the time to generate the scenarios in, starts increasing exponentially. So to avoid this, what we have done is to constrain the number of branches to n minus 5, and you can see here that to produce, uh, with, with that constraint, to produce about 20 millions of scenarios, uh, it takes only six seconds, more or less. So to summarize, the proposed method does consider the number of branches. So let me go here. So it scales up with the number of branches of the system, but with that constraint, we can reduce the execution time, for example, from uh, minutes to seconds. So for the Nordic 44, uh, we see that we can generate up to 24 million scenarios just in five, six seconds. So uh, for this speaks really well of this ad hoc Monte Carlo method. But of course, several changes have to be made for even larger systems, perhaps constraining the number of uh, contingencies to n minus four or n minus three. But n minus five is acceptable and good enough for this purpose. So now that we know how these scenarios will be constructed, let's talk a little bit about data generation. For the dynamic simulation, we have employed OpenIPSL and Daimola, that is a Modelica IDE. OpenIPSL is an open source Modelica library for power systems that is currently maintained by Altset Lab at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And this library contains several power system components for phase or time domain simulation. Those components have been validated against a number of reference, among them PSC, that is really widely used in the power system industry in North America. And using OpenIPSL and after having built the models with th those components, the first thing is that uh, to generate the data is to select the scenario that we would like to study. So we know that a scenario in the, for, for this case is composed of uh, a number of lines that will be opened. So the next step, if we know the lines that will be open, we need to change the value of their transversal admittance to a very large number. Then afterwards, what we do is to make a 
to take advantage of this built-in function of the AMOLA that is called linearized model. So this allows us to get an analytic Jacobian of the power system model. So the computations here are done using symbolic uh, math, not, um, not numerical methods. And that is one of the main advantages uh, of Dimola for this application. Then after getting the A matrix, what we should do is to get the eigenvalues. Then having the eigenvalues, we can uh, compute the damping ratio and that would give us a set of inputs, eigenvalues and outputs that are the labels, the damping ratio or the classes to which the eigenvalues belong depending on the value of the damping ratio. So we have repeated this 20,000 times for 20,000 different scenarios. So we, of course we haven't done this by hand. We have automated the whole data generation process using the Python Dymola interface. That is the Python API for Dymola. So here we see the, the output of this data generation procedure, uh, but this is not the end of it. So we notice here some problems, quotes problems, that are going on with the data. So let's get started by this eigenvalue here that corresponds to a really fast mode, probably a controller. So this is too far away from the origin. So basically the data is spread. But not only on the x-axis, but also on the y-axis where we have uh, this bunch of, or these three clusters of eigenvalues. One problem is that we know that there will be, uh, so the, the imaginary axis corresponds to the stability boundary. And if all of these eigenvalues are clustered or are gathered around the imaginary axis, then the machine learning algorithm can have trouble finding or learning that decision boundary that rep is represented by this imaginary axis. So I already mentioned this. So the solution to this problem is to perform data preprocessing. In this case, we have performed a normalization, but a selected normalization of the eigenvalues. So this means that we have normalized uh, everything that is outside of the unit circle. Why? Because the damping ratio depends basically only on the angle that the eigenvalue forms with the imaginary axis. So if we, if we have an eigenvalue, let's say here, and we normalize it, it will keep the same angle, but now it will lie on the unit uh, circle. Um, we haven't normalized anything inside the unit circle for one main reason. So let's think of this eigenvalue here. Uh, or this this is one is better minus 0 0.5 if we normalize it it is sent here to minus 1 so we are losing the information of how close how close this eigenvalue is to the um, stability boundary that is not a problem if the eigenvalue is here at minus 1.2 because um, we know that it's sufficiently large right uh, so it's sufficiently distant from the from the origin, but that could be a thing for eigenvalues that are extremely close to the to the um, uh, real axis, and that is even more uh, problematic for eigenvalues um, for complex valued eigenvalues. So after this normalization process, uh, we notice that the that we still have some eigenvalues here in the origin. So this would mean, from the nonlinear systems perspective, that we cannot conclude anything about the stability of the system using Lyapunov's direct method. However, this is where domain-specific knowledge is useful. So these eigenvalues at the origin, or extremely close to it, are not relevant for the analysis because they come from the swing equation. In the swing equation for the electromechanical model, we pass from angle to, ang to angular speed. So we need, we have some integrators there. So these eigenvalues basically are not meaningful for a small signal, uh, for a power system small signal analysis. Based on this, we define now the groups or the categories that we will try to predict using the machine learning modules. So this is called labeling. So we know that the, the 
metric that we will use to compute the labels is the damping ratio. So for when the damping ratio is negative, we will define that group as being the unstable class. Then for the damping ratio between 0 and 5%, we'll say that, okay, we need some action on the system because the oscillations are too high, so the eigenvalues are too close to the stability boundary. Then if the damping ratio is between 0, uh, 5, 5% and 10%, percent we will say that the system condition is acceptable. Then if it's the eigenvalues, the dominant eigenvalues uh, are complex conjugate, so they will say that, but the damping is not um, that low, say that the operation is good. And finally, if the dominant eigenvalue is real, then we will uh, label the operation of the system as satisfactory. So here, this additional group here, the irrelevant eigenvalues comes from the fact that we are bringing domain knowledge into the machine learning design. So here is a, a picture of how the decision boundaries look like. And I would like to emphasize again that this decision boundary over here was introduced because we brought some domain knowledge into the machine uh, learning uh, implementation pipeline. So in other words, we know that if the classifier is good, it could be because the classifier for some reason is learning the damping ratio, what the, what the damping ratio does, right? So in that way, uh, we know that at the end, the classification system will replicate that damping ratio rule, but we'll do it in another way, in another fashion, probably faster, probably will be more efficient than if we, than if we hard coded the damping ratio algorithm in a microprocessor or, or in a DSP for real time computation. So let's not uh, now talk about uh, some implementation issues. So this is more related to the training code. Uh, first of all, um, at the moment we were working on this, we, we worked with TensorFlow 1 and back then uh, that um, package did not support backpropagation with complex weights. So the way that um, we have addressed this uh, problem is to see each eigenvalue as a two-feature input with real and imaginary part. So more or less like this. And then the split with scikit-learn was done. Uh, the splitting of the data between training and testing was done with the Python library scikit-learn. And we have taken uh, the default setting. So 75% for training and 25% for testing. So this corresponds to 700,000 eigenvalues roughly for training and seven, um, uh, the remaining 250, um, 250k for testing. And this arrows, so basically that looks everything perfect. So we could, uh, fit this data to, to the machine learning modules and do the training. But there is another issue that should be taken into account and as that the data set uh, could be skewed. So this is the case for, for our experiment. So what does it mean? Basically that we don't have the same number of entries in each class. So we could have more uh, acceptable eigenvalues than any other group. And that could lead to the implementation or to the conception of biased classifiers. And that is something that we don't want. However, here is where the large amount of data that we generated comes into play. Basically, since we have enough eigenvalues, we can pr allow ourselves to take only the minimum number of among all the categories for training purposes. So what does it mean? Basically that for these 700,000 entries, we will take just the minimum minimum for each group. And by doing that, we will have now a balanced data set, meaning that, that we will have the same amount of entries for each one of the categories that we would like to predict using the machine learning algorithm. So now, uh, before jumping into the description of the training of, of the methods that we have uh, trained, uh, I would like to uh, stop here a little bit and ask uh, a question about the rationality of machine learning. So why are we using machine learning for something that can be solved by just computing the damping ratio? 
So moreover, if we construct a code to implement this damping ratio a formula in, in closed form, we will ha have a, a classifier with 100% accuracy. So while we would like to replace something that it's perfect from the machine learning perspective, so it's a perfect classifier. And one of the reasons we have found empir empirically is that uh, we would like to bypass this domain-based um, or domain domain-based uh, domain knowledge-based classifier with machine learning because of execution time. So we have uh, so to compute the damping ratio for all cases there is not a closed loop formula. So for complex eigenvalues there is, but in other cases we would have to use some iterative methods. And uh, for the method we have implemented, it took for all the eigenvalues of this uh, 20,000 scenarios, it took five seconds. Then after uh, with the neural network to, to make the predictions for all of them, we it took only 45 milliseconds. So we're, and for another machine learning technique, it would took 0.2 seconds. So we're talking about that the neural network improved by 120 times the prediction time of the conventional classifier. So this that is a two order of magnitude improvement. And that is really important for real time applications because we are saving time. So we're saving computational time. So basically we are reducing the delays uh, that are in the process from which the information is obtained to the to the to the point where in time where the information is is brought to the power system operator. So now uh, let's talk about machine learning techniques. So uh, the design from end to end, we have prepared a supplemental video that you can check in this YouTube link. And then in this video, we go from uh, stepwise uh, throughout all the different stages or the different parts uh, of designing a machine learning technique. So we read the data, have insight into it, pre-process it and then construct each of the techniques step by step. So this is something that uh, we encourage you to, to go through. Uh, and it's an excellent pl place to start uh, to get your hands dirty with the uh, machine learning um, techniques and machine learning implementation if you haven't done it previously. So the techniques, the traditional or, or conventional machine learning techniques that we have uh, used uh, are that we have uh, benchmarked are these five logistic of some regression support vector machines k nearest neighbors decision trees of naive base and the code as i have said before uh, you can you can uh, find the code here under this uh, link and the video it's on the presentation but for more references um we'd like to point you to this excellent book by aurelien Geron that has um excellent uh, explanation about the concepts be behind each of these techniques and also has a lot of code to play with so let me just uh, stop this and let's uh, talk a little bit about the neural network architecture so for this case since we we, uh, we didn't um, want to make something real complex so we just um, um, selected a multi-layer perception with four layers uh, there is 100 neurons in each layer. The activation layers for all of them, except the last one, are really U units. And for the last one, since this is a multi-class classification problem, we have selected a softmax. Um, and another thing that we have done was to add some dropout layers with non-trainable parameters here and here. So at the at the first uh, at the input layer and the first hidden layer. And this was done to reduce overfitting and improve generalization performance. Now that uh, we have um, arrived to the point of performance metrics, um, basically, I would like to give a small example for non-data science people like me, because sometimes uh, it is real simple to get confused about the different uh, metrics, whether the performance, for example, whether the performance that the classifier should maximize precision or accuracy or recall. So this is a pretty simple example that um, I like to to uh, remind every time I am <laughs> I'm confused about it. So let's um, just uh, 
analyze the case where Jack uh, receives a call and they are telling him that he won the lottery but, and are asking him for his bank, uh, bank account details. So depending on what already has, uh, what actually has happened, uh, there could be valid scenarios where Jack makes the correct decision or he could make some mistake that statistically is called type one error and type two error. So in statistical terms, uh, when he makes the correct decision that is called either a true positive or a true negative, true positive when he makes like the positive decision that in this case is if he wins the lottery should give um, the his bank account details to get the money. But if actually it's a hoax call, then the right decision is not to um, give any information. So this is called true positive and true negative. And what happens, for example, uh, this a uh, false positive basically is what happens when he makes the, um, the the wrong decision because the hypothesis, as this is called in the statistics, is is false. So, and that is a false positive. So when here this error that he commits here, it's a re like really, it's something that is really bad for this example because if you have won the lottery but you don't believe it, so you don't want to lose that that money. So this is in this case a, f a type two error because the hypothesis was true but the, the decision was 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 wrong. So based on this, a uh, really straightforward metric is accuracy. That is basically the number of total positives and uh, true neg of true positives and true negatives divided by the total amount of predictions that we are making. And in some cases, uh, in in most cases, you you want to maximize accuracy. But depending on the application, uh, it would be better to maximize precision or recall. So why? Uh, let's. Think about first about prediction, uh, pr uh, precision. Sorry, so precision is the number of true positives divided by tr uh, true positives plus false positives. So, by maximizing precisions, we want we would like to minimize the number of false positives. So, in this case, we would like, for example, um, for the ca case of Jack, if he tries to maximize precision, he would be. Um, trying to minimize the cases in which he uh, does not give the, or in which he gives the bank, his bank information to people trying to scam him. On the other hand, uh, recall is the number of true positives uh, over the number of predicted results. So it's uh, true positive over true positive plus false negative. So by maximizing recall, we try to minimize false negatives. So in this case, um, let's think about this. If he has actually won the lottery, maximizing recall, so if the classifier tries to maximize recall, is to minimize the type 2 error. So that would be preferable for the case of the lottery because he would be, so Jack would be minimizing the cases in which he has actually won the lottery, but he doesn't give his bank details. But that is, this is true for this specific example. But depending on the, um, on the application, we would like to maximize precision or maybe we would like to maximize accuracy. So what we have proposed is a metric that uh, takes into account both acu all of them. So accuracy, precision and recall in both the training and testing sets. So we have uh, given 40% of the of the weight to the testing set and 20% of the weight to the training set. But also we included this number here that is the execution time. Why? Because we are in, in the frame of the grid, we are interested in developing a classifier that is suitable for being uh, uh, deployed in a real time application. So this metric uh, has this uh, equation, but basically the only strange part is here. So the classifier with the lowest time will get the highest score. So in the end, the me the method showing the highest score is the best uh, with respect to this multi-criteria metric. So here are the different results that we have obtained. And so, so here, um, there is nothing strange because first of all, we see that the damping ratio based classifier, we want to call it like that. So it's the implementation 
of the damping ratio based uh, classification rule. This obtains the best metric, so it's perfect in, in every single sense because it classifies everything 100% accurately. But in terms of execution, time is not the best, so the score is among the, the lowest. Then here, it's, it is a straightforward to see that uh, among the machine learning methods, uh, the k-nearest neighbor is the best performing one. It's almost 100% in all with respect to all the scores for the testing set forgot to say that this table uh, is, is uh, with respect to the testing set but the execution time harms k nearest neighbors a lot so we need to balance there is a trade-off between precision and execution time and the sweet spot is achieved by the neural networks basically because the, new, the execution time is the lowest and the scores are pretty good uh, with respect to accuracy precision and recall so now that we know that uh, that sweet spot is achieved by the neural networks, let's have a look into how the neural network is doing um, by, uh, on predicting the, um, the label for the eigenvalues. So what we have done here was to take the, the eigenvalues of the testing set and getting the actual prediction for all of them. Uh, we emphasize here that we didn't include in the legends the irrelevant eigenvalues, but here they are colored are, as, as gray. And on the right, we have uh, the actual predictions by the neural network. So first of all, the main thing that a classifier for a small signal stability should do is to label everything that is unstable as, un as unstable. So we see here that, that that is the case. So we visually don't see anything of other color in this region where all of this, the, the eigenvalues here should be red. And that is something good. Then, visually, we can see that the problems, the most of the problems that we can appreciate are come from this region here, where some um, good eigenvalues are misclassified as critical. But uh, a more better way to have to get a feeling of how the neural network is doing is to use the confusion matrix. So here. Everything that is in the diagonal of the confusion matrix are the instances or the, the inputs that were correctly classified and the numbers on it, the off diagonal entries represent then the number of elements that were misclassified. For example, in this case, uh, almost 3000 elements belonging to the class one were mislabeled in class six. So class one is unstable. I, uh, operation class 2 is critical, acceptable, good, satisfactory, and irrelevant. So what we see here that the neural network is doing is misclassifying unstable as irrelevant. So these eigenvalues that should be, should be labeled as unstable are labeled as being within a neighborhood of the unit circle. So that is not that bad. Because if this happens, we could raise a yellow flag and maybe validate whether the eigenvalue is numerically close to the origin. So in that case, we should just not be alarmed of the condition of the system. So that is not that bad. Then for the rest of the categories, we see that the classification is small. So this means that the classifier is highly accurate. And for here, here we appreciate that given the large number of instances in this class, the misclassifications are small. So the decision boundary is really clear and the neural network has that property of being able to learn highly nonlinear decision boundaries. To summarize, uh, we would like uh, if you want to check this uh, work in more detail, we would like to invite you to um, to go to our paper, Synthetic Training Data Generation for Machine Learning uh, Small Signal Stability Assessment. But the main takeaways here is that, first of all, we have proposed another method for generating contingencies massively. In this case, it was a simple two-stage Monte Carlo technique. Using this technique, we have uh, generated 20,000 scenarios and the process to generate these contingencies uh, was automated using the 
Python Daimola interface for a model constructed um, uh, on the Open APSL library. And then the data that came out of this data generation part was used to train machine learning solutions and a neural network to classify the eigenvalues automatically. Finally, we see that the neural network among all the methods that we tested showed the best performance in terms of both execution time and accuracy. So this shows that machine learning solutions have potential to be deployed in real-time applications. And finally, uh, I would like to invite you again to check the code for um, these experiments. So here is the code for, for this paper, and here is the code for the video tutorial that we have prepared for this um, presentation. As uh, so a final, and I would say that uh, the most important idea of this part is that uh, we have shown a systematic way to generate data from simulations. So for power systems, the equilibrium points are given by the power flow conditions. So we can generate as many power flow conditions as we want using market data by varying stochastically a load or many other techniques that you can imagine. So once we have the equilibrium point, we, what we could do is to associate that power flow to a contingency scenario. So the main problem that arises here, so this is this is what constitutes a simulation scenario, but the main problem is that we will have too many power flows for too many contingency scenarios. So here we could use another Monte Carlo method to sample the power flows that we will associate to the contingency scenarios, thus limiting the number of scenarios that we will have. So indeed, we will have a large number, but it's a little bit smaller, smaller so that it could be um, managed uh, by a simulation program easily. So after this, we pass the simulation scenario configuration to a power system simulation tool. And here for this uh, small signal uh, stability analysis, we use the linearization routine to get a set of eigenvalues that is fed to a deep learning module implemented in TensorFlow or Keras, among other uh, machine learning development environments, to get stability metrics. And these stability metrics can be used to uh, evaluate automatically the condition of the system. Hi, welcome to the third part of the tutorial, which is focusing on inference at the edge. Uh, I am uh, Luigi Vanfretti, and I'm an associate professor at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. And uh, I lead the Allset Lab Research Group and Laboratory. <clears throat> I previously was an associate professor at KTH Royal Institute of Technology, and I also was a special advisor at the Norwegian transmission operator called Statnet SF. Um, since joining IPI uh, in 2017, I've been uh, leveraging previous experiences uh, in my research area and using them to collaborate with uh, different uh, industry partners in the United States to state and federal grants. Uh, related to this work, uh, this is uh, work we're doing through this, the uh, funding from the New York, New York uh, Research and Energy Agency, and uh, is funded through projects uh, 137151, and in part also by 137940, and also thanks to uh, to Coast University. Okay, let's get started. So the use case or problem that we will be using for uh, the discussion of inference at the edge is one of my favorite problems. I've been working on this since 2011, I think, and is uh, real-time forced oscillation detection at the edge. And the work that we did here is together with um, uh, uh, my colleagues at Cal University in the Grid X project. So uh, the problem is that we're trying to identify forced oscillations which are likely the product of some synchronous control interactions between wind farms and the grid. This also happens with other devices like HVDC, uh, PV. Anything that has power electronics will sooner or later end up chattering. So um, not chattering, but uh, oscillating. So in this picture over here is from uh, a paper that I published a long time ago now. 
that is basically a compendium of all the problems that we dealt with from design to implementation to testing even in the, in the field of a, a software application that would do the detection of these oscillations. And uh, it has a little comparison between PMU data and SCADA data. You need PMU data to do this or faster if possible. So what happens is that uh, basically you enter in a, a condition in the grid that results in resonance with the local control systems in the wind farm, and they start oscillating at different frequencies. So you could see here an example of a real test that we did, uh, injecting oscillations at the distribution network in Spain. It was about six hertz, whereas the one that we saw in the real field is here at 12 hertz. So uh, that's the first part of the problem, that uh, uh, the statement. The second part is that, of course, you know, you want to do detection so you can take an action. Uh, the potential actions that can be applied now with exist existing technology will be that basically you trip uh, the individual unit or the entire farm, uh, wind farm that is op operated, or you can ramp it down. So you will have to slowly decrease the power dispatch to stop the oscillation. Uh, there's, of course, other ways that you could do that, but this is something that you can do right now with existing technology and, and methodologies, let's say. Uh, this is not covering here. Uh, we're doing, trying to do some work on that. Uh, so it, I'm just going to cover the part of the detection. So as I mentioned before, uh, previous work, and not only mine, has been uh, based on statistical signal processing based methods. And the method is one basically of energy detection within a given bandwidth. Uh, the, the energy detector was actually proposed in the 1990s by John Hauer at BPA, but with a different goal. And that goal was basically to figure out when there was uh, nice events that you could then analyze in the PMU data streams. And this is what is implemented uh, in, in uh, this software application so basically, what these methods do is that they take a little bit of a window of data. Uh, they, you compute the power spectral density. In this example here, you have the power spectral density uh, using a non-parametric method called Welch and a parametric method called Yule Walker. So you have the two of them to, together. You know, you can tell that okay, you 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 do have something there, and what what is done is that you basically are going to create frequency bands. So this is at very low frequencies. Like, uh, so this, for example, is from 0 0.15 to 1.5 hertz. This is around these low oscillations that are a typical inter oscillation range. There is more of this, right? So there is another one here from 7 to 11 hertz. And the idea is that you create frequency bands, and for that frequency band, you're going to detect how much energy there is for under this uh, uh, frequency range, right? So uh, basically, you calculate the energy, and you have to set some thresholds of where this energy is low when it becomes high and when it's dangerous. So this can help you to basically react. However, uh, one of the uh, major problems with this is uh, that it has filters, so it has inherent de uh, delays. And the lower the frequency range, the longer the delay. Uh, so this approach is practically centralized today. Of course, you could uh, do it distributed, and is today it's, all, it's not fully automated, so the, to do anything, the operators have to respond. Uh, the other problem with this is that needs careful parametrization and tuning for experts. So uh, this is uh, the example from applying the methodology to uh, replaying the data in real time. And using this uh, lab platform, basically we injected to the distribution network oscillations through this converter and then we use the PMU data connected to a workstation run the application and what we found there is that it's 
actually quite hard to come up with which signals are good to use depending on where you are. Uh, so in this case here, we were using the voltage magnitude. Here, the voltage magnitude was completely dominated by the strength of the network. But if uh, when we looked at the current, we could st still see the oscillations being injected uh, by the converter. So that's one problem. The other problem is that how do you define these thresholds? And uh, how much time do you allow after you reach the threshold to start uh, the, uh, to actually make an action? So for example, here you have 55, uh, uh, 0 0.55, so that's at 55 seconds, and 10 seconds after you have reached more or less the level, I mean, not only this approach is slow for doing anything quickly, but also um, it's hard to tell whether the threshold should be unless you have a lot of data. So given that you need a lot of data, maybe there's some other way that we should do that, right? Now, the pros of this approach is that uh, there's a lot, all of these methods are similar to the techniques used for mode estimation. So there's a lot of confidence from users that are familiar with it. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's the first thing to consider. Okay, so uh, let's frame now the problem in a different way. Uh, can, instead of using the existing methods or signal, statistical signal processing based methods that will require to filter your data and so on, the existing literature, can we use uh, AI or machine learning to help uh, meet in evolving requirements and needs because what we needed for mode estimation is now turning out to be very different to uh, identifying uh, these uh, force oscillations and to control them, right? So the, this is an evolving requirement. We can't really use the same tools for the same problems, what I'm trying to say. Why? Well, what we noticed doing all our, our research and our tests is that we really need to increase the detection speed. Right? I don't want to wait five seconds to take a decision w when you reach a high level of uh, uh, subsynchronous control interaction. I want to take that at the minimum after one second. So that's the idea. And I want to maintain acceptable detection accuracy, if not better, at least the same level of accuracy. Uh, so now the challenge is that we have to train the machine learning algorithms with a very few and very small amount of useful real world data. Or that's just in the cases such as this. This is data from Oklahoma Gas and Electric. that we, we They have uh, been helping us with the data for so many years. So here you can see the uh, frequency the voltage and the current, and you see here the inception of these oscillations. So we do have real world data, but we don't have a tremendous amount of it. And uh, this is only when the plant exists. What about cases where your plant has not been built? Then there is no data at all. So how do you do that? So the idea is to combine, if exist, uh, real world measurements, and use uh, simulation results for training. I will uh, explain how we, uh, we kind of did this part also. And the last requirement is like, if I wanna do control and protection, that has to be at the plant level. So I cannot wait an eternity in terms of the power system process. I cannot wait for the data of the PMU to be sent to an operator uh, through the communication network, have whatever PMU application they're running to give me a result, and then send back the, the, the action signal. I mean, that process is going to take so long that it becomes useless in terms of control and protection. Of course, it's very useful for screening uh, uh, this uh, activity. So, we can't use the usual route. We have to do something at the plant level. Okay, so of course we could use uh, uh, um, 
technologies that uh, we can deploy in the field, like an industrial computer. But in reality, we don't need to do that. What we need to do is controllers and protection systems that are kind of similar to what we deploy today, but that we have uh, machine learning capabilities. Uh, and this is possible because there are both low cost embedded systems and not so low cost that can be used for. And this kind of frames the entire problem of inferencing at the edge. So there is on the edge. So in this case, this is a little car. And what you can see on top of it is an NVIDIA uh, Jetson that has uh, everything that you need to make local decisions based on a trained model. So you can think about this as the control system in the plant, as the protection system in the plant that will take these local decisions. Okay, so if we want to do this remotely, what do we need? So we have to make a separation between training and inferencing. So we, you're, we're on, unlike the previous example from Sergio, we're not gonna do the inference locally at the same server, okay? So we have to deploy it in an embedded system. And that carries a lot of requirements with it. So the process to be able to deploy at the edge starts like this. Uh, you have untrained neural network, for example, that you want to use as your machine learning model. And then you will use a piece of hardware that is suitable for training machine learning algorithms. So this is a, a NVIDIA DG, DGX1 system. We, I wish I had that. We have a smaller server, but it's enough for what we're doing. And you take this untrained neural network and you take all of your data that you're gonna use to train it, okay? So in this case, this little car is being designed to use the, its camera to detect if what it sees is a cat or a dog, okay? So it's gonna take local measurement, a local image, a new piece of data, and it's gonna pass it through the network, network to do the detection. In this case, we have to train the neural network that is gonna be deployed with the capability of detecting the cat, okay? So there is a very strict separation between these two. There are at different locations, there are different devices, and therefore they have entirely different requirements. And well, this looks uh, uh, very much like what we need to do in power. We need to do training of the machine learning algorithms, just as we like, like we do protection system design, just as we do control system design, we need to train. Now, it's a little bit different, but it's very similar that we do it through studies. And then the second part is the deployment, which we need to take this train model and actually deploy it on the device. This is not so, different of what we do with relays that we go and we parameterize the settings of the algorithms. Okay, the big difference is that this is dedicated hardware technology to do this in this embedded system and dedicated hardware technology. Well, not so dedicated because you can use it in gaming, but it's similar. So that's really the problem of inferencing. And if you haven't noticed, right, if you have two-way communication, you could actually take the new data that you have take the errors that you get, if you get any errors in the detection, and you send it back to the training phase. So you actually can close the loop in the way of automating the, the quality of your trained models and your decisions. This is unprecedented. This is unique. If we can get this to the field, we could improve a lot how we operate the system by the ability of sending back the uh, local data to improve the training set. So I think that's really unique. All right, uh, let's go to the next slide. So how are we going to solve this problem of uh, uh, detection? Well, we're gonna do it with the one of the most successful applications of uh, machine learning that is detection and classification. So we know what we're looking for. It's cats, right? It's cats. Okay, those cats in our case are gonna look like this. This is our, our very clear 
force oscillations, okay? Uh, we, but however, what we see most in the measurements are dogs. So if you take one, a sample of one second, a snapshot of one second in the power system data, it looks rather random. So what we will use is that we, we will have a database now of pictures that looks like dogs and cats. And I know you can do this in another approach with LTSMs and time series, but I wanted to test the basic concepts that I used and I, I, uh, we decided to well, let's just create pictures, just like it's done with uh, uh, the, pre the previous problem of detecting a cat. So uh, we use exactly the same approach. And as you see, each of these uh, layers is our neural network layers that are going to be able to, uh, once they are trained to detect given a cat picture, be able to tell if it's a cat or not. So we will use this approach. Now, uh, the, the proposed approach to have a field deployment is going to require better accuracy of what we can get with the few pictures that we have. So uh, the entire uh, procedure that we will follow is that we will do training. We will use labeled data, either from measurements or from simulations. Okay, so for the training and validation of the neural network model, we will use both real data and simulation. And then the inference is required to be done in real time every second as a new input passed through the algorithm and model. So the way that we envision and we tested this approach is that we have a PMU, the PMU will uh, generate PMU data and you will send it to the embedded system. You'll read in the embedded system, you will read the C37118 data, create a buffer of data. You take uh, um, the measurements, you normalize it, and then you uh, make a plot. And you create this input every second of a little 80 by 80 pixels image. And this is passed to the trained neural network model that is deployed now in the embedded system. And it will tell you uh, uh, what it is. So, uh, that's the entire approach, okay? So how do we do labeling and how we do transfer learning when we have both measurements and simulations? So labeling of uh, PMU data, we had PMU data available and we label data as normal or as a, a dog or an oscillation event, which, which would be the cat, that's what we're looking at. Well, all of this was done manually and it's extremely time consuming to do it. So uh, even if we had few cases, it was a lot of work to label all this data. Well, what if you don't have any uh, data available? So we actually generated from a model uh, because we didn't have a, a, a model of this plant at all, uh, it's proprietary. Uh, I actually created a little model myself that reproduces the same features and I use Modelica and Daimola for it. And the other reason of using Modelica and Daimola is because all the uh, Modelica tools, as you saw in, saw in Sergio's presentation, have a very nice Python API and can be deployed on Linux platforms. So in, in the tooling that we built to do this, the, uh, being in Python and being able to run these models a gazillion times was uh, uh, key. So this is how we generated all of our PMU data, okay? Uh, if you look at this uh, model, the bottom part is uh, configured uh, to, uh, to inject a force oscillation uh, at, a, at a given amplitude and at a given um, frequency. And this allowed me to automate uh, the labeling for simulation data. So for uh, uh, simulation data, it was much easier to do labeling than for the PMU data itself. That I had to evaluate visually and run some algorithms uh, for detection of the modes. Very time consuming because you have to verify it. Here, I know exactly when I am injecting the oscillation 
what is the amplitude and what is the frequency. Now, to simulate the power system, I use a second order model and I set the, uh, in the poles of that second order model, I set typical uh, frequencies that I see in the data. I mean, so I've been evaluating power systems behavior for a long time. I can tell more or less how it should look like. Okay, and to that transfer function, we inject the, the, the oscillation, but we inject other uh, features of what I've seen in real world data. So we have a, a, a pulse every now and then. I inject a pulse every second of very low amplitude, okay, that shakes the system a little bit. Uh, then we uh, inject two ramps, one at uh, 50 seconds and the other one at another 15 seconds. That basically makes the system go up a little bit, make the system go down a little bit. And then we inject uh, random noise. Uh, that's completely random. And we are using the, uh, um, a special library in Modelica uh, to do that. And the result is that my uh, an example here is that this truly looks like random data that you have from a power system. And you can label that as normal. That's a dog. And then this one is labeled as oscillation. I know exactly where I ejected when I took it out. And it can be configured through the Python API for different frequencies. So with all of these capabilities, we will generate all of this synthetic data with very, very close features as we have as the real PMU data. And this now gives us a library of dogs and cats. So you see we have normal cases, okay? And then we have a clear cat over here. So you can see that the frequency of the oscillation cases is never the same. And that's by the ability to automate the simulation process with features that you want to vary. Uh, so this was extremely useful. And we will then take this library of synthetic data to do training and we will, uh, to do transfer learning, we will inject into the training set some of the real world PMU data. Um, what is the effect of that? Okay, so that brings me to how to do the training. So. Uh, we will be using convolutional neural networks or CNN. These are classifiers that are known to have outstanding performance in the field of pattern recognition. Uh, I mean, that's how you do um, a lot of the image Google search that you can uh, upload a picture and it will recognize it and find you the exact figure where it came from. Uh, that's pretty neat and that's done by CNNs as I understand it. So this convolutional neural networks are patterns that are learned through translation. So after learning a shape, a confnet can re recognize it anywhere. So that's learning through translation. To do this translation, the first layer over here will learn from small local patterns and a second convolutional layer will learn largest patterns of the features in the first layers and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, so the, the neural networks that we chose are two designed by ourselves and a number of other ones that are available in the machine learning tools that we use. So uh, the two proposed uh, neural networks uh, are uh, uh, one is one dimensional and the other one is two dimensional. Uh, the 1D model is composed by uh, two uh, 1D of 64 channels and one max pooling 1D followed by a dropout. Then we have a dense layer of 100 channels. And the proposed 2D, 2D CNN is similar to this AlexNet architecture that is very popular, but we reduce the depth, okay? And the depth is uh, the number of layers that you have. Uh, yes, so the, for our proposed C, uh, CNNs, we want to illustrate how the input decomposes the different uh, uh, filters learned by the network and we have to uh, we have shown here this map 
So this actually shows you our second convolutional layer of how it's learning the oscillation patterns. Of course, uh, uh, this will be refined if, when you have more and more layers. Okay, so here is a, a, a performance assessment of our existing models. Uh, this is the real PMU data that we use for the for the training. Sorry, for the testing. Um, so what we're expecting is that the model can predict normal or otherwise dogs and uh, cats, otherwise when there's an oscillation. And uh, we are uh, uh, evaluating the accuracy, uh, the numbers of false positives, the numbers of uh, missed events, and the time for inferencing each new prediction in seconds. So you see that we are uh, doing very well with the simplest uh, 1D. Uh, well, it's not the simplest, but it's the 1D uh, that we proposed. Uh, it misses six events, and it, it does the prediction in um, 2.7 milliseconds. That's fast. I mean, you can't beat that. That is, is excellent. Uh, and here, that's not the only one that does uh, fast. If you notice, the dense uh, uh, one is it takes 2.6 milliseconds, but it has a lower accuracy and it has more false positives. So basically, you have to kind of learn, uh, not learn. Uh, you have to assess the performance by looking at other networks and. You know, you have to make a trade of, of accuracy versus speed when you select something, right? So you want, of course, the most accurate, uh, uh, but also speed is important. So, yeah. So now that the model is trained, we wanted to see how we can improve inference by transfer learning. So the transfer learning approach allows us to take or a train model and add by adding real world data to it, uh, improve it. So the way that we did this work is that uh, we took simulation data that is uh, basically almost 12,000 uh, files for the training. And uh, we took almost 3,000 files for validation from the simulation data. So we have a 25% ratio of uh, training versus uh, uh, testing slash validation. And the real data contains uh, 967 samples, and that's only 15% uh, of our uh, synthetic data set. So we don't have a lot of real data, but we're gonna use it. What are we gonna use it for? Okay, before I tell you what we're gonna use that for, I have to explain that we are doing this at all the bus bars that we have measurements for, and that's more than 15 substations, okay? So, sorry, it's, uh, uh, yes, more than 15 is 73 terminals, so I don't remember exactly. I can check that if you really want to, but basically we take 73, uh, terminals and we train the neural network model with A, simulation data only, and B, with simulation data plus the real data. Okay, so we're gonna, we have done simulation data and we're gonna transfer or learning from that and add the real data to the training. And the reason we do that is because basically we want to train, uh, we want to improve accuracy. Right? So in the case of where we only use simulation data, we have 93.94%. And in the case where we're injecting real data, we have 96.79%, okay? So uh, the, the model that we trained over here was trained uh, originally was only using the simulation data, uh, as I explained before. And to that, we added the, uh, the, the, the real world data. So this transfer learning approach helped us to lift up or, um, or, or uh, prediction accuracy tremendously. I mean, 
it looks like only 93%, uh, but it, when you look at, at all of the different terminals, that is one of the points in the x-axis, well, that's a significant improvement for a lot of them. So, so it's not just how it performs in one location, but we wanted to see how in general this could be achieved at different locations. So it was a, an interesting experiment. Uh, the performance of uh, the 2D uh, versus the 1D models is shown in the next slide. So we only see a very small advantage of the 2D uh, convolutional network, neural network. We have a global accuracy of about 97% here. Uh, so 96.79 versus 96.19. So th this is very small uh, improvement, uh, improvement. Okay, but it's it's uh, it depends on how how hard you want to go with, go with the accuracy requirement. So as I mentioned in the beginning of this part, doing inference at the edge is an entirely different business than doing it uh, in a, a server or a local machine. Okay, so uh, what we did here is that we took three different uh, uh, machine learning environment, uh, deployment environments. Uh, yes, uh, you can use a PC, of course, right? You can use an NVIDIA Jetson Xavier, or you can even use a Raspberry Pi if you manage to fit the algorithm in it, okay? So they all have different hardware capabilities in terms of uh, uh, CPU, RAM, and GPU capabilities. Uh, there is no GPU in the Raspberry Pi on this example, so that's a, a, a serious um, a handicap. You can put a, a, a local uh, GPU or um, a tensor processing unit, uh, but we wanted to show uh, that you know, depending on what you pick, you'll have a, a trade-off to consider. So what we did is to take uh, um, the time to make a prediction and average it on 1,000 predictions on these different platforms, okay? Uh, the proposed architecture that we have shows a 97.41% uh, of the proposed uh, 1D shows a 98% when we did this, okay? on each of the different hardware. Now, we need to understand the trade-off of performance versus time. So what, we do, uh, what we're doing here, you see we have an NVIDIA uh, 1080 Ti graphics card to do uh, the inferencing, and we have a Core i7 uh, processor in here. So all the inferencing is a is, uh, mix of um, how fast the CPU can load the data into the RAM for the graphics card to read it and make a decision and pass it back to the output. So we're testing this without uh, measurements. We're basically sending a data file, reading it to the GPU and, and having the GPU write the prediction, okay? So that's how we did this testing. Now, the time for prediction is excellent. Uh, with this uh, um, uh, platform, we have uh, 4.9 milliseconds, which is quite acceptable for the one um, with with uh, the 2D CNN, and the 1D is even faster, 2.2 milliseconds. Okay, but the cost is $3,000 on a gaming computer, let's say. If you go the embedded system route, okay, now you don't have uh, a big CPU, you don't have a gigantic GPU, okay? You have a, a smaller, uh, and you don't have 32 gigabytes of RAM, you have much less. So you have this little NVIDIA Jetson, uh, Xavier, this one cost uh, $700, okay? And for that cost, you actually lost an order of magnitude in both cases of time for prediction. This is still very acceptable, okay? It's 30 milliseconds. That's practically one cycle, or you know, uh, in 60 hertz, you, you, it's close to one cycle. It's excellent prediction time. But nevertheless, you have uh, one uh, order of magnitude difference. And in the other case, you, you have uh, 17, so basically half the time. 
And finally, if you want to go the cheapest route, you get, you know, for about $100, you can have a Raspberry Pi with all the SD card and all the accessories you need to run it. And that will take half a second, basically. All right, so here we have an order of magnitude uh, uh, decrease. And really, I'm basing more for this average 1,000 predictions. It was much better with the Comp 1D, but basically we want to use the one that has the highest accuracy, right? So basically, approx what we found approximately is that one order of magnitude performance increase with one order of magnitude cost increase, just for the computation on the edge. This is not benchmark considered the, the other, there's many other platforms that we can use this, and we don't have local IO. Okay, so there's two ways to go around to do the IO because we need to send the measurements to the device. Right now we're reading a file. Okay, you could also use the local IO and have way faster uh, prediction, but that's for another uh, talk. So here is a video of uh, a real-time demonstration. In here, we're gonna use a real-time data source. So we're gonna stream synthetic PMU data generated using a PDC emulator uh, in a computer and the data that is being injected is a 60 hertz random data followed by a sinusoid, uh, a sinusoid. and then we take away the sinusoid. The real-time data transfer is carried out over a local LAN using TCP IP and the C37.118 protocol. Finally, the, uh, the Edge platform that we're using is a NVIDIA Jackson Xavier with uh, TensorFlow, which is deploying the machine learning model, and, they, and it also has the necessary way, uh, tools to read in the PMU data. So uh, as we start this video, you will see over here in this portion is where the data is set as random and then is changed into a sinusoid and then is changed into random again. You will see in this plot over here, the sinusoid or the random data. And in this part over here, you will see the detection, okay? So let's look at that. So starting with random data, is now being changed. The sinusoid starts injected and immediately is detected. It continues the detection until it is removed as shown now. There. So what are the conclusions or the key takeaways that you can get from this presentation, from this part of the tutorial? Well, you can do real-time fast oscillation detection using machine learning, and it's gonna be fast and it's gonna be accurate. And we can deploy it on the edge, but we need good data for training. Uh, not all of the data is created equal unless the data has the behavior you want to recognize. Even if you have terabytes, all the data is of very low value if it doesn't have the behavior you need to detect. So simulation-based models, physics-based models, or models that you can build out of your own heuristic knowledge that reproduce the signatures that you would see are key. Uh, the, so as I showed anyway, you will need to improve the accuracy once you have real world data. Uh, this will involve labeling. It's very time consuming and it requires expert knowledge. It's really not easy to tell apart a cat and a dog when you only have seen a few. Okay, if you've seen uh, a very few uh, in your life, you can't really tell. So. Expert data data sets are very key for development. Uh, with regards to machine uh, learning models and methods, um, there is so much out there uh, available from other areas. My point of view is that we need to carefully adopt that and adapt it for power system applications. I don't really think we would need to reinvent the wheel. I mean, we, what we need to prioritize is that we need to learn where the gaps are. Where do we really need something new? And we can't learn where we need something new unless we test what it exists first and we understand it. So there's really no need that you do more 
fancy machine learning algorithms unless we understand what the gaps are for the power system applications. And that also uh, comes in into implementation. You don't need to re-implement your own tool set for machine learning, just use open source tools. This really enables portability and reuse. And hopefully that will enable faster industry testing or adoption. So just use what Google makes and maybe that can make it easier that somebody will use it in, in, in the field. Uh, transfer learning is a killer. I mean, it's a fantastic way of improving the accuracy of the models. You need real world data for that. There's no, no way around it. But, you know, uh, the good news is that we can do a lot with simulations. Transfer learning is going to be the key between uh, having a too little accuracy to enough accuracy. And finally, inference at the edge, it's really a fantastic op potential and opportunity in power because uh, we can hopefully close the loop into updating the way that we do controls and protections. We can actually do it more often through a closed loop of getting new data into the training models. I think that's really the key, and I hope I can continue working on that. Um, so this, and also there is low cost platforms that have a great potential for simple uh, power system applications that, you know, you don't need to detect, to do more than on and off with, but you need 99% reliability. And I think we can achieve it even with low cost equipment. So that's very attractive. Uh, if you want to make a company or whatever, go ahead. The last thing I want to say is that hardware infrastructure to train at scale is costly. All right. You can't do training in a laptop. Please don't try it because it's going to make you wait for years or hours there. It's get good hardware is worth the investment. All right. Now that we have covered the three parts of this tutorial, I want to summarize everything that has been discussed in just a couple of slides. So what are the f key takeaways of the first part? Um, so in the first part, uh, uh, Tetiana demonstrated how we need to uh, create uh, simulation scenarios. So for that, we, uh, she developed an algorithm for realistic contingency selection of uh, to generate synthetic data. The generator generation or processing uh, uh, aspect is time consuming. It will take 50 to 80% of development time uh, if you don't have means to automate in that. The algorithms that we, uh, both Tetiana and Sergio proposed and implemented can help with reducing that development time. Uh, but you have to be extremely careful when you generate the data, as we've discussed many times, what you give to the model defines the output, okay? So we have to be very careful how we generate the data. So means to automate simulation scenario generation are really needed in power systems, okay? Um, if we do that well, we could actually develop new realistic approaches using machine learning for power security assessment. Uh, Beyond that, right, how do to create these uh, simulation scenarios in a way that really has full coverage of what we're expecting is really an open question. In the automotive field, they have, been, they have created the open scenario standard to, to develop the simulation cases. And, you know, the, the, the evolution of what they have done there is tremendous. So we need to catch up when it comes to that. Having openly open access, not open, not behind the paywall, but open access standards and software tools that do the simulation scenarios in a well-defined way can help. But only if they're open access and open uh, so, so software based. Otherwise, it's going to take a long time to create good ways of doing this simulation scenario generation. And that's why we have given you 
what we ha what uh, Tatiana has implemented as open source because we believe that this is a necessary area to develop. Uh, well, now that you have a lot of uh, good data to do training, uh, how do you use it for something? So we took one of my favorite problems that is for uh, stability assessment, in this case, uh, eigenvalues or uh, oscillations. And instead of just focusing, for a focusing on a specific frequency range, we took every, every potential range uh, and uh, 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 an array of undamped and damped oscillations. Uh, here you see that uh, uh, what we developed can be deployed in, in many pipe pipelines for automated analysis for small signal stability. And the key that you saw here is that we can prove execution time with acceptable accuracy, if not the same accuracy. So uh, we go from uh, an entire order of magnitude improvement. That is a significant improvement for real-time applications, okay? Going from seconds to milliseconds, it's substantial. And especially uh, when it comes to, to, to this kind of applications, uh, there is no need to reinvent the wheel. We really need to understand where the gaps are on the existing uh, methods and technologies before we start developing something that is because there are so many good resources right now that we don't completely understand how to use for power system applications that really need to be understood, tested, and finding those gaps is what really will require new machine learning uh, um, foundational results. We don't need foundational results to solve power system problems. We need to understand what is out there and apply it. And for that, we need uh, uh, open source tools for portability and reuse, which hopefully can help for industry adoption. So for example, don't use proprietary tools for uh, uh, the machine learning part when there is TensorFlow, there is Keras, and there is PyTorch, and they are you know, used by the leading, bleeding edge uh, machine learning uh, institutions such as Google. And in the third part, really, we take a smaller subset of the oscillation pro uh, uh, problem and we focus at, uh, on inference at the edge. So here, the idea was that we, want, we don't want to central, a centralized application. We want to do it distributedly and we want to do it as fast as possible. So here, uh, one of the biggest ch challenges was to label the real world data. Uh, uh, it was very time consuming. It required expert lo uh, uh, knowledge. So the key thing to remember is that we need expert created data sets for R&D. We need to work with industry to have access to those. And we need experts from industry that really know what they're looking at to label them. I mean, I have some practice, but sometimes I can get uh, confused. And so it's very good to talk to somebody from a, a company that has been doing this as their job because they can bring a lot of insight. The second thing that we learned in part three was transfer learning. Uh, this shows us that it, simulation is a fantastic to develop surrogate models, but those surrogate machine learning models need to use real world data once deployed uh, to improve accuracy, okay? So that's the good news is that we can deploy things, bef bef uh, machine learning based algorithms before the plant is built. So it can be part of the design process of a plant, but we're gonna have to update that. The, the fantastic thing about this technology is that if we do it correctly, we can actually have a closed loop between the performance of the algorithm if we send the new data to improve it and the new decision. So we can actually close that loop and minimize the error between design and uh, operation. Now, uh, the most important thing about inference at the edge is that yeah, software and algorithms, you know, the foundational thing of the algorithms matter, but nothing matters more at the edge than the hardware. 
and hardware constraints will matter even more. The hardware resources on the edge in these embedded systems will limit what can be deployed. So we did a lot of things where that's why we have so many models that we tested where we were like, oops, it doesn't fit. So when we trained in a big computer, big machine learning model, and then we tried to deploy it on a Raspberry Pi, we were out of memory. Okay, so it doesn't fit. It's too big. You need a bigger graphics card. Well, that's an afterthought. That is not doing design correctly. So what we learned from this is that we actually have to embed hardware constraints from the start of the design. It was a little bit way of a clumsy way of learning that, but this is clear to me now that a hardware will matter the most. It doesn't matter how well your algorithm can do inferencing if it cannot fit with the resources available in your platform. The other thing that I've learned through these few years in machine learning is that hardware infrastructure to train at scale costs money. And unless you spend money, you can't get anywhere fast enough. So for example, one of our servers that we use for this has two Quadro GPUs and two AMD Epic Core uh, processors. So we have 128 cores, and I don't remember how many uh, uh, GPU cores we have, and we have half a terabyte of, of uh, RAM. It costs around $40,000. And this is what Sergio is using for a lot of the work that we're doing. We need that. If we don't do it, we have to wait for days to get a result. I mean, you can't work like that. So don't, you can't make a silk purse out of a pig's year, okay? Yes, your PC is powerful, your desktop is powerful, it has a GPU. You can't train a scale with that. You need good hardware. My other message is if you're a professor, please be kind. Don't ask your student to do in a laptop what should be done in a, at least in a crappy server that the one that I'm showing you. Ideally, we should be able to make this point across to the NSF and the other funding bodies that if we're gonna do serious work, we need serious hardware. They, and when you look at what they do at Google and Nvidia, <laughs> The smaller uh, system for training is the DGX1 that has four graphics cards. It's a monster system in my view, but it's nothing compared to the data center. So if you're working in this area, I really, really would like to ask you to please put this point across. Don't be cheap just because the software is free doesn't mean we can get far enough if you don't ask for the tools we need for and we need heavy computed power. The other point of this is that all of the simulation software that I know, even the software that we use that is open source, or, and like or all of our power system libraries are open source, we welcome to use them with OpenModelica. We also use a proprietary tool called Imola because it's faster and, it's high, and it can be deployed on Linux. So the other point about this is that we are not only GPU bound, and we need computer systems that supports x86 64 architectures to run our simulators. So we can't use HPC platforms that don't support traditional architectures because some problems are gonna be CPU bound. Generating simulation data is CPU and RAM is a constraint. GPU is not used, but the machine learning problem you have the GPU and its RAM as the bottleneck. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, I hope you have enjoyed the presentation. In the next slide, let me just show you some references. I hope you have enjoyed this tutorial. Uh, here are the main references uh, we use for the tutorial. Part one is this paper by Tatiana uh, as the main author. The second part is uh, this paper by uh, Sergio, which will be fully presented in a session tomorrow. And the third paper was presented at the Saudi Arabia Smart Grid Con uh, Conference uh, by Ilias. Uh, this video will be uploaded in my YouTube channel in case you wanna share it with other people, your students or colleagues. 
And in an effort for reproducibility of science, we're providing our source code and power system models in the following two links, the part one and two uh, examples uh, are provided in this uh, repository. And the OpenIPSL models can be found in the OpenIPSL project. Finally, if you want to learn more about the Modelica based power system models and simulation tools that we used, you can read uh, this paper on the OpenIPSL and uh, uh, for the library uh, description. And then uh, on the performance of the Modelica tools, you can read this paper by Sergio and uh, my students and I that we presented in the American Modelica conference. Finally, if you want to read more about previous work on wind farm to grid controller interaction, here is a paper that summarizes uh, all of the work that we did over four or five years. And here is another paper that uh, uh, shows you the experimental tests. With that, I would like to thank you very much for st sticking until now and hope you fi have found this presentation and this tutorial of uh, value. Uh, thank you very much.